Buongiorno a tutti. This is the Italian News and English podcast for August 2013. We are back after an eight-month hiatus, reorganized and recommitted to producing one podcast a month, full of the latest political, economic, cultural, and sporting news from across Italia. Mi chiamo Gio, reporting today on this feature story. The Italian news agency ANSA reports that Italy's Supreme Court on Thursday upheld the conviction of former Premier Silvio Berlusconi for tax fraud committed as head of his nationwide media empire. The ruling means that Berlusconi, after two decades of dodging conviction and sentencing for a wide variety of offenses as a private citizen and elected official, faces a four-year jail sentence, with his appeals for the tax fraud conviction in a case that began in 2006 now exhausted. He can also be ejected from the Italian Parliament if the Senate pursues this action and face a possible five-year ban on holding elected office. According to the French news agency AFP, the conviction upheld by Italy's highest court revolves around a film rights deal at Mediaset. Bloomberg reports that Berlusconi's company evaded almost 10 million U.S. dollars in taxes from 2002 to 2003. Bloomberg also reports that Berlusconi, now 76, is currently engaged in the lengthy Italian appeals process for two earlier convictions, one for illegal wiretapping and another for having sex with an underage female prostitute. But while a minority of Italians find solace in the high court ruling, believing long-awaited justice is at hand for the brash billionaire who has made a mockery of Italy since first elected as premier in 1994, AFP reports that polling just prior to Thursday's ruling indicates that most Italians still support the right-wing People of Freedom Party, or PDL, an organization inseparable from Berlusconi himself. Possible reasons for this loyalty in the face of such chronic and serious misconduct include a two-millennia-old mistrust of government officials, including the Italian justice system, The fact that Berlusconi and his party have opposed tough austerity measures since the 2008 economic collapse that they arguably helped precipitate, and a deep and historic cynicism that dwarfs anything we experience in the States, a point of view that actually attributes virtue to those Italian political leaders who are prosecuted for wrongdoing, arguing that all leaders engage in such acts, but it's the honest ones who get caught and who are most reliable, and whose ability to work the system for their own gain translates into good, shrewd political leadership for all. Boldness, this line of reasoning goes, is the most prized quality when dealing with the Italian bureaucracy, the media, and the European Union. But there is much more at stake for Italy than how Silvio Berlusconi will spend his last years or what role his long-sorted story will be assigned in Italian history. The party he continues to lead, the PDL, formed a coalition government in April with the center-left Democratic Party, an unlikely pairing of left and right wings that was negotiated after Italy struggled for two months with no clear leadership following an election that left the country with no direction for a new government. Current Prime Minister Enrico Letta, Democratic Party leader, and the fragile coalition government he leads, can come crashing to the ground if the right-wing group still led by Berlusconi and his PDL party withdraw their support. AFP reports that Mr. Letta is asking for calm, asserting that his government, continuing at any costs, is in the interest of the country. Bloomberg News quotes Leta as saying in Rome last week, I am absolutely aware of the politically delicate moment. I hope the collective interests prevail for the good of the country, the good of Italy, and not the partisan interests. Observers note that the Italian economy, which continues to struggle with record debt, high unemployment, low exports, and rising costs, would be further weakened by a chaotic collapse of the existing government. But Berlusconi and his most fervent allies are singing a very different tune, 
unable to win on appeal or wait out the statute of limitations, as he and his attorneys have done in other cases. In a video Berlusconi released after the ruling, he vowed to continue to fight what he called baseless charges and to resume his political career. Some report that offline, Berlusconi said new elections must be called as soon as possible, essentially threatening to bring down the Italian government in the wake of Thursday's ruling against him. Anza quoted Berlusconi from the video as follows. We'll tell the Italians to give us back the majority to modernize the country, starting from the most indis indispensable, the justice system, to prevent the citizen being deprived of his freedom. He called his prosecution an unequal judicial attack by left-wing magistrates who have been out to get him since the 1990s. And he asks, what is my prize after 20 years of commitment to public life, accusations based on nothing, and a sentence that takes away my liberty and political freedoms? That's how Italy recognizes the sacrifices and commitment of its best citizens. At the same time, many on the left were demanding that the Senate vote immediately to expel Berlusconi from Parliament. But experts suggest that's a long and complicated political process, and given that the very existence of the current Italian government is at stake, expulsion from the Senate is an unlikely outcome. In fact, actual time in prison for Mr. Berlusconi appears almost as unlikely. Bloomberg writes that criminal lawyer and Salerno professor Andrea Castaldo believes the four-year sentence may ultimately be knocked down to one year due to a recent law designed to reduce the population at Italy's tragically overcrowded prisons and that Berlusconi has until the 15th of October to request an alternative punishment to jail such as confinement to his home or community service. A request likely to be granted given the nation's typical leniency toward the elderly. On Thursday, the court even took a pass on instituting a possible five-year ban on holding office for Berlusconi, stating that additional review of that sanction was needed before it could be imposed. If okayed by the courts, Berlusconi would be required to give up his Senate seat. Meanwhile, Bloomberg asserts that the sharp divisions between left and right in the government are deepening. Still, Berlusconi cannot run for election for six years, and the government has seized his passport. Whatever the outcome of his final sentencing, he will have serious restrictions on his freedom and time, and Bloomberg already describes him as embittered and shaken. But even Italian political experts are divided over what will happen next, with some arguing the only remaining question is how Berlusconi will leave the national and international stage by political or judicial force or by his own will, and others, like Giovanni Orsina, a professor in Rome, fearing what the embattled leader has up his sleeve next. Bloomberg quotes Dr. Orsina as saying, Those who think this story is over or nearing the end are mistaken. The end will be long and the risks bloody. According to ANSA, President Giorgio Napolitano, who helped broker the coalition government last spring, is trying hard to remain hopeful that Italy can avoid a political and economic bloodbath, asking all to respect and show faith in the judiciary, and to demonstrate what he calls serenity and cohesion on institutional issues. But with fire eaters in the PDL turning up the rhetorical heat, Mr. Napolitano may be asking for the moon. ANSA reports that Michela Biancofiore, a PDL member in Parliament and current Cabinet Undersecretary, called the court ruling against Berlusconi the apocalypse of Italy, the end of the Italian political world, and any semblance of democracy. She is also publicly urging defense attorneys to plead Berlusconi's case to an EU court on human rights. And while PDL officials, like Bianco Fiore, serve up such hyperbole, ANSA says that comedian turned anti-establishment organizer Beppe Grillo, head of the populist Five Star Movement, which resembles the libertarian American Tea Party in some ways, is selling a very different narrative, dancing on Berlusconi's grave and the grave of the Italian government. Berlusconi is dead, ANSA says Grillo wrote on his blog. His conviction is like the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Time will tell. But this much is apparent. 
No one knows exactly what's going to happen next, and such uncertainty has little chance of stimulating the economic growth the Italian people need so badly. At least long-time observers can agree on one thing. There is nothing in his past behavior to inspire hope that Silvio Berlusconi can resist the temptation to pull Italy down with him should he suffer an irrevocable fall. And so we wait. We'll be back in one minute with news briefs from around Italia. There's no rehearsal for the life that we led These things just happen and we put them to bed You won't believe that very moment was last The times before us always move much too fast Goodbye never said It's probably better that way Like painting pictures with a colorful gray There's no promise or no reason to stay Nothing in this life is certain anyway Goodbye never said mm -hmm. That was a portion of the 2013 release Goodbye Never Said by Calabrese American artist Phil Angotti of Chicago. Angotti's music is available for purchase on iTunes by searching for Angotti. A-N-G-O-T-T-I. And now, these news briefs. ANSA reports that the busy boulevard in Rome that runs from the ancient Colosseum past the Forum and on to Piazza Venezia has been closed permanently to automobile traffic by Rome's mayor, Ignacio Marino. Marino says he's closed via De Fore Imperiali to all but pedestrians, bicycles, city buses, taxis, and emergency vehicles in order to stop pollution and vibrations from harming the 2,000-year-old archaeological treasures. ANSA says that while Romans fume over poor signage for alternative routes and additional traffic backups in their crowded city, Marino, an avid bicyclist himself, envisions a pedestrian-only locale around the ruins, including future archaeological digs beneath the current street, which was constructed by Benito Mussolini. Thanks to this pedestrianization project, Via dei Fori Imperiali will become the most stunningly beautiful boulevard in the world, the city's website now states. The already desperate economic circumstances of young Italians may be growing worse, with ANSA reporting in late July that the unemployment rate for those in the 15 to 24 age group is now over 39%, up almost 1% from the previous month and almost 5% compared to the same period in 2012. ANSA says that about 650,000 Italians under 25 years old are now seeking work. Just this week, after the Swedish furniture company IKEA announced a new store will open in Pisa, Tuscany in the spring of 2014, 28,000 applicants submitted resumes for just 200 new jobs. ANSA also says that an Italian retailer's organization reports that as many as 32,000 shops have closed their doors across the country in just the last 18 months. In Venice, witnesses claim a 100,000-ton cruise ship almost ran aground and nearly crushed a water taxi not far from Piazza San Marco last week, a report that renewed calls for a ban on such large ships, despite the revenue generated by the tourists who disembark in Venice for the day. ANSA says that while the tugboat drivers hauling the ship deny there was any such incident, Memories of the Costa Concordia sinking off the Tuscan coast in 2012, killing 32 people, remain fresh in Italians' minds. Many Venetians, led by environmentalists and preservationists, also oppose the presence of ships like the Carnival Sunshine because of the damage smog and vibrations have on the beautiful but decaying buildings of the old city. 
Anza says that Andrea Marcucci, head of Italy's Senate Committee on Art and Culture, is calling for new regulations to ensure a disaster like the sinking of the Concordia never happens in Venice. Anza quotes Andrea Zanoni from the EU's Environment Committee. It's time to move beyond words before another tragedy happens. We must definitely ban big ships from passing through the lagoon. But with the French news agency AFP reporting that the cruise industry generates more than 500 million euros in revenue each year and provides more than 5,000 jobs in Venice itself, chances are a total ban on large cruisers isn't coming anytime soon. And so the old city's 58,000 residents continue to be stuck, as travel expert Rick Steves has asserted, in a classic Catch-22, needing the revenue from its 20 million annual visitors in order to survive, while the presence of the same 20 million visitors is slowly but surely contributing to the death of their city. The London-based Telegraph reports that Italian police recently arrested more than 100 suspected Mafia leaders in separate raids that took place in Ostia near Rome and in Calabria near Contanzaro. The raid at dawn in Ostia included 500 police officers, many of whom were heavily armed, arresting 51 suspects. According to the Telegraph, the Fasciani, the Agati, and Triassi families were the focus of the Ostia raid, accused of running illegal gambling operations and planning murders to protect their territory. In Calabria, the raid focused on the Calabrese Indrangheta, with 65 arrests. The Telegraph says that among the suspects arrested were doctors, prison guards, local businessmen, and political leaders. Senator Piero Aiello, a member of Berlusconi's PDL party, is under investigation for buying votes, while Giampaolo Bevilacqua, also of the PDL and leader of the airport authority at La Mezia Terme, was arrested for alleged mafia connections. Police suspect a number of those arrested for taking part in a series of mafia-related murders that took place between 2005 and 2011. About 200 million euros in assets were seized from businessmen. The Telegraph points out that the raids took place just one day after Franco Roberti took over as head of Italy's anti-mafia directorate. Since Italy's first black cabinet minister was appointed in April, she has been subjected to frequent racial slurs, taunts, and even death threats, but none so openly violent as an incident in Cervia Ravenna in central Italy, in which a man threw bananas at her as she delivered an address. Ansa reports that Cecile Chienghe, born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but an Italian citizen, brushed off the attack posting on Twitter it is a sad waste of food, considering the economic crisis. Kienge, who as integration minister, is striving to help Italy's African immigrants gain citizenship and integrate successfully into Italian life, was attacked verbally this summer by Vice President of the Italian Senate and leader of the Northern League Party, Roberto Calderoli. Calderoli told a crowd of supporters, I love animals, bears and wolves, as everyone knows. But when I see pictures of Kayenge, I cannot help think, even if I don't say that she is one, of a resemblance to an orangutan. Calderoli later apologized under pressure for his remarks. The bananas thrown at Kayenge at the gathering in Ravenna fell short of the minister, and Ansa says the culprit fled the scene without being identified. Police are investigating, and security around Kayenge has been stepped up. Kienge faces the double challenge of helping immigrants integrate into society during tough economic times and the endemic racism that has long plagued Italy. But others are rushing to her defense, including Andrea Orland, Environment Minister, Maria Chiara Carrozza, Education Minister, and Gianni Alamano, once Mayor of Rome. Ansa reports that Alamano called the incident in Cervia another shameful and disgraceful gesture, pledging solidarity with Minister Kienge and calling on Italy to isolate the idiots. July 30th was declared a national day of mourning in Italy for the 38 people killed in a bus accident outside of Naples on Sunday, July 28th. 
Ansa reports that mourners filled the stadium in the town of Pozzuoli for a mass funeral for the victims, all of whom had traveled with friends for a weekend to the nearby thermal baths and the town of Pietrelcina, birthplace of the popular Italian saint Padre Pio. Police believe some type of mechanical problem caused the driver, who was among the victims laid to rest on Tuesday, to lose control of the vehicle. The bus struck six cars on the highway before striking and going over a guardrail and falling into a ravine. Italian Premier Enrico Letta attended the service. Ansa quoted Pozzuoli Mayor Vincenzo Fioliola, This tragedy cuts my heart in two, he said. We must make sure their deaths are not in vain. Something didn't work, someone is responsible. We must find clarity, and I'm sure we will. According to ANSA, Italy's national railway, Ferrovi dello Stato, has unveiled a new cutting-edge high-speed train, the Frecchiroso 1000, capable of reaching a top speed of 223 miles an hour. Designed and built by Italian company Ansaldo Breta and Francis Bombardier, the high-end passenger train is part of a 1.5 billion euro government investment in modernizing Italy's trains. Fifty of the 1,000s have been ordered, at a total cost of 1.5 billion euros. Each train will consist of eight cars, with space for nearly 500 passengers, a bistro, and seating for those who use wheelchairs. The body design is snake-like, red and silver in color, with tinted windows. The 1,000s will supplement the high-speed trains already in service with Trinitalia. 60 ETR 500 Frecciarosa passenger trains, capable of reaching a top speed of 186 miles per hour. The 1000s are slated to begin passenger service in early 2015, focusing on key tourist destinations and Italy's major cities. They will also be compatible with tracks beyond Italy, making service from Italy abroad possible. About 70 new slower regional trains are also being built to replace the oldest trains now in service. In a statement, the National Railway explained that the Frecciarosa 1000 is set to raise the current technical, environmental, external and internal aesthetic standards while guaranteeing maximum performance and travel comfort. Before final testing later this year, the 1000 will embark on a promotional tour of the continent as Europe's fastest high-speed train. Serie A, Italy's top flight football league, kicks off the 2013-14 season later this month, with defending champion Juve of Turin visiting Sampdoria and AC Milan traveling to Hellas Verona on Saturday the 24th. Among the opening contests slated for Sunday the 25th is Fiorentina vs. Catania, Lazio at Udinese, Napoli vs. Bologna, Roma away to Livorno, and Genova away to Inter Milan. A few questions to consider as Calcio resumes across Italy. Will Juve's acquisition of talented Argentine forward Carlos Tevez from Manchester City and Spanish striker Fernando Lorente from Bilbao put Juventus over the top? Can they compete with big boys Munich, Barcelona, PSG, Dortmund, and Madrid in this year's Champions League? Can Napoli, having lost Edison Cavani to Paris Saint-Germain, but gained Gonzalo Higuain from Madrid and Pepe Reina on Rhone from Liverpool, make a serious run at Juventus for the league title? Last year, Naples finished second to Juve, nine points back. But new Napoli coach Rafa Benitez, in from Chelsea, is hoping to close that gap. With Fiorentina's acquisition of German international Mario Gomez, a world-class striker, how high can Florence fly? La Viola has high hopes of improving on last year's impressive fourth-place finish, just two points back of AC Milan and one place away from qualifying for Champions League play. And finally, speaking of Milan, will Mario Balotelli keep himself together all season, helping return Milan to form picking up where they left off last spring. At one point, Balotelli, who joined Milano from Manchester City in January, led the Rossoneri to eight wins and three draws in 11 matches in which he played. So this season in Serie A is going to be an exciting one, with Juventus once again the clear favorite, but Napoli, Milan, and Fiorentina staking their own claims as contenders. 
That's all for this edition of the Italian News and English Podcast. We welcome your comments on stories from this or previous episodes on our Facebook page. Search the Italian News and English. Grazie mille e ciao.